This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. For thousands of years, the quest of humanity has been for quantity of life. But now there is dawning the increasing quest for quality of life. From primitive times to the present, humankind have sought predominantly for things. The search now centers increasingly upon meanings and on values. From the earliest Aegean civilizations, through the Carthaginian empires, from the imperial monarchy of Augustus in Rome, to the dark ages of the Byzantine era, from ancient oriental societies through a century scarred by world wars, the issue has been physical survival more than spiritual striving. But humankind are entering now an era in which depth of life is becoming as important as length of life. The Spartans created a civilization trained to kill and dominate. Thoughtful individuals in the present generation are wondering if it would be possible to create a civilization trained to love and to serve. Are global and interpersonal hostilities inevitable? Have the great philosophers and spiritual leaders of human history, the philanthropists, educators, servants of humankind, have they all been merely genetic mutants of some sort, entirely unlike the rest of the planetary population, or do they represent, in fact, the unactualized potential within every human being? Such questions as these are increasingly under discussion, not only in campus pubs after philosophy class, but on the assembly lines, at farmhouse dinner tables, in executive washrooms, at downtown metropolitan bus stops. The growing interest in this sort of question is only one of many indications that there is dawning in our time a rethinking of our philosophy, a spiritual renaissance, which one day is going to make more differences in this world in the way this world is than any war which has ever been waged, any battle which has ever been fought, any governmental, political, social, or economic upheaval in all the totality of human history. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato argued that citizens should be governed by philosophers. And yet I foresee the day when the citizens will be the philosophers. The last 100 years of planetary history, in which science has created both an unprecedented technology of war and an unprecedented technology of leisure have permitted humankind a clearer perspective of the full range of human good and evil in potential along with the time to think about these issues if indeed men are born free but everywhere they are in chains who have we to curse for our shackles but ourselves we and we alone have created a technology of destruction, our sometimes unjust political systems, our economic and social oppressions, and we alone, human beings, can alter them. But what is the source of such change as that? Every person on the planet could cast an affirmative ballot for a perfect world to commence tomorrow morning at sunrise, but in order for the world to change, the people of the world would have to change. Throughout all of human history, it has been at this precise point that political and social philosophy have been consistently frustrated. Good government ultimately depends on good people. Even a government of law, not of men, must recognize in time that since those very laws are created, interpreted, and executed, by men, by human beings, the most significant issue remains, therefore, whether or not these are good men and women or not. A changed world is contingent upon changed individuals. It is in the recognition of this that the spiritual renaissance of planetary proportions is beginning. The political philosopher Edmund Burke described government as a system created for fulfilling human wants. If then the wants, the desires, the most deep and heartfelt aspirations of humankind were to become the quests for love and truth and beauty and goodness, would not then the foreign and domestic policies of the nations in time respond to that human want? The great hours of history are heralded by the trumpet blasts of great ideas, 
and great ideals. Thus, a future era of world harmony will only emerge from intensified global consciousness of the idea and the ideal of world harmony. Many of the bloodiest periods of human history occurred during the times of belief in the divine right of kings. Permanent peace will result when it is recognized that divine rights belong, in fact, only to the divine, to God, that no mere human is entitled to divine sovereignty in government or in any other realm. Only when spiritual priorities are reverenced as of paramount importance can an age of permanent peace come to pass on this war-bled planet. Are human beings innately, inherently hostile, overbrimming with anxiety, hatred, vengeance, Anthropologist Alexander Aland, in his book, The Human Imperative, argues that man as a species, Homo sapiens, is not inevitably aggressive. Societies exist, such as the Semei of Malaya, in which violence is practically unknown. Anthropologist Aland concludes, and I quote, culture is the major determinant in human existence, end of quote. The human imperative, he argues, is that humanity must develop a culture on this planet, an ethic, a more, a societal structure, which is counter-violent, which is peaceful. It is precisely of this which I speak in stressing the urgent necessity of a spiritual renaissance. Not until the peoples of this earth have come to love, positively to love, peace, goodwill, and friendship as a way of life can a generation free of warfare be achieved. And it was precisely to this Jesus of Nazareth alluded 2,000 years ago when he proclaimed the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man as an ideal of human existence, the love for God and love of humankind, the vision that all this world is in truth one vast, though unsuspecting, family. The cosmic family of God. Human progress consists of a confluence of two processes, complication and simplification. Our science and our technology are complicated, but it is only through an understanding of the simplest components of the material world, molecules, atoms, and electrons, that our contemporary technological and scientific progress has been possible. In the early development of written language, a picture of a bee symbolized either a bee or honey. A sketch of two men shaking hands meant friendship. Yet writing with pictures was a slow, arduous process. In the development of human languages, progress meant simplification. Pictures were reduced to linear symbols and eventually became the modern alphabets. Complexity depends upon simplification. Paradoxical but true, the human alphabet had first to be simplified before more complex thoughts and concepts could thereby be expressed. This too is precisely the genius of Jesus of Nazareth. He simplified the complicated ritualistic ceremonial religion of his day to a simple love of God and people, this fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man, this family of God concept, and this complex scientific technological society more urgently than ever before needs to hear and heed that elemental, simple, comprehensible concept. Jesus compared the entire universe to a family. One psychiatrist, Nathan Ackerman, has written that the single most encompassing reason for our conspicuous failure thus far to prevent mental illness derives from our failure to cope with the mental health problems of family living. End of quote. Practically every problem encountered in our culture has its roots in the family. Likewise, must the solutions to those problems which plague and imperil the planet be found within the family. The anthropologist Margaret Mead, who has devoted much scholarship to a cross-cultural study of the family, asks this question, and I quote, Is there any way of life not built upon the family? This world can be no better than its families. And until humankind begin to view all of humankind as one vast family of God, interculturally connected by bonds of spiritual empathy, there cannot come to pass the permanent peace this planet quests. 
A vast many human beings do not know where they're going, why, how long it'll take to get there, or whether it's worth going in the first place. Multiple millions of lives are unmarked maps and broken compasses, devoid of a sense of direction. Like weather vanes, their purposes point whichever way the wind may be blowing at the moment without conciseness nor consistency. Millions have not found a sense of God's guiding will, which watches and waits within. Life abundant, life joyful, declared the master, be of good cheer. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Fear not, he said, be not anxious. There's a plan and a purpose and a reason for your human existence on this earth. Be you doctor, lawyer, school teacher, chicken plucker, pickle slicer, olive pitter, abalone diver, housewife, or whatever. God has a use for your life. And thus to seek for the will of God changes three things in your life. First, it changes your attitudes. Second, it changes your consequent actions based upon those attitudes. And third, it can lead you into new fields of endeavor altogether. Whenever you confront a decision, ask yourself two questions. Is it consistent with the love of God? And is it consistent with the love of individuals? Can I do this to the glory of God and the service of people? These were Jesus of Nazareth's two great commandments his two primal criteria for good decisions and good actions. How often have you heard someone say, and perhaps you've said it yourself, that there's really nothing one person, a single individual, can do to change this world? But consider that for a moment. Consider, for instance, the lone assassin. You say very well, true, a lone assassin does change history, but he changes it for the worse. Very well, but since we have just established that one single individual can change the world, yes, for the worst, but change it, then why, I must ask, could not one single individual likewise change the world for the better? History is replete with example after example of precisely that. One way of reading history is to view it as a succession of biographies, the stories of the lives of great men and women, single individuals, private personalities, who made decisions and acted in consequence upon those decisions. You may be saying to yourself, but I'm just not that kind of a great man or great woman. I am not a pivotal personality. But don't you realize that at one time, neither were they. It was by the ideals they held, the convictions by which they lived, the decisions which they made that these great men and women became great men and women, remembered by planetary history. And God may have more in mind for you than you have ever dared to dream. God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your life. And declared the Master, Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address. SRI Box 3080, Oakhurst, O A K H U R S T, California, C A L I F O R N I A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation. Nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something. Simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.